Hello and welcome virtually at least. My name is Ryan Kobar and I'm here to present to you today on OODA looping in a turbulent world. I normally prefer to be there in person and receiving your adulation on a stage with your roses thrown at my feet, but we'll have to do this a little bit virtually instead. First, a couple of legal statements. Um, my legal department required me to say this before I speak publicly anywhere, but do not buy stock on anything I say. Nothing I'm doing here is about expectations and I lie often. So just avoid anything I'm doing that's referring to Splunk at all because it's just not gonna help any of us out. A little bit about myself before we go on. Uh, my name is Ryan Kobar. You can find me on Twitter at MeanSec, which is less about my personality and more about my belief of being average. I'm a distinguished security strategist at Splunk. I've been there for about six years. I've spoken at a whole bunch of conferences around the world, although I have to admit not as much in the last year as I would have preferred. Um, I've done a lot of things in my career, a lot of public and private, mostly around the ideas of nation state hunting and cybersecurity. Uh, but for the last couple of years, I have been at Splunk. And with my background in the Department of Defense in the US, I am a huge fan of a concept called OODA looping or the OODA loop. Uh, to the point where a little bit of a mockery, but one of my colleagues gave me the title of Minister of OODA Looping at Splunk. Uh, and I do love the concept and I wanna share it with you a little bit about what that means to me today. So quick agenda, uh, because legally RSA said I had to have an agenda. Uh, what is an OODA loop? Why aren't we talking about attacks? So I'm gonna go a little bit into what OODA loop is and the idea of um, cognitive thought models. I'm gonna talk about how you can take what happens in an incident or in the news and actually turn that into a new opportunity for hunting and defending. We're gonna discuss how using something like the OODA loop actually allows you to convert uh, some of these problems into successes and then also impact your adversary who's attacking your network. Uh, we are not gonna be flying any mission accomplished banners. I had enough of that with my time in the Persian Gulf. And then of course, we'll do a conclusion. So your take at homes or stay at homes or to goes, I'm, not really sure in this new world. Uh, but I want you to kind of look at OODA loop, which was originally, as you'll learn, a fighter pilot uh, terminology, something used by fighter pilots after the Korean and Vietnam War, and how it applies to cybersecurity. Uh, I'm gonna walk through a couple of case studies of the news of the last year. Uh, and we're going to use that to prepare for your advances tomorrow and also talk about how to take case studies in the future and apply them. And finally, we're going to discuss a concept that my team has used very successfully over multiple years, which is fail less. Uh, every day you fail, uh, that is the reality of being in the blue team is every day we fail, but tomorrow we try to fail a little bit less. Uh, my previous life, I worked at DARPA for a long time and they have a great mantra there. 99% of DARPA projects fail, but when they win, it's the internet. Um, and so you have to be okay with the idea of failing and kind of molding forward as long as you're iterating almost one might say in a loop, a constant loop of success and failures. So let's get started. So first, what is OODA loop? Why should I care? So the concept was created first by Colonel John Boyd, who was a fighter pilot in the US Air Force. Um, and he wrote a really fascinating white paper many years ago in the 1960s with a, a great, uh, what appears to be handwritten front page here about the concept of OODA loop, which stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. And in the world of fighter pilots, uh, this is where the analogy comes from. In the world of fighter pilots, it's actually about how they find what's going on, how they figure out where they are, what they do, and then how they act. So if we go from the first aspect of observe, in a fighter plane, you may be familiar with what they look like from movies, or maybe you were a former fighter pilot yourself, in which case this is a very boring talk for you. Uh, but fighter planes have a long, elongated, almost teardrop canopy, uh, which is perfectly clear, right? Gives them almost 180 degrees or 360 degree view all the way around them so they can see what's going on. And that's to allow them to observe. And so fighter pilots are constantly looking around, they're observing, they're kind of, kind of looking around at where they are, they're using radar and they're observing. And when they actually do observe a threat, to another fighter plane or something going on, they then move into a concept called Orion. And the idea of Orion is we are used to working in two dimensions, right? We, we live on the ground, most of us, once again, unless you're a pilot. And you know, you can go left, you can right, you can go forward and you can go back. Uh, but what we can't do is go up and can't go down, right? We have a X and a Y, but not a Z. In the concept of fighter pilots and flying, what you have to do is understand where you are and you have to orient yourself to the threat. Uh, so when you're a plane and you're flying and you find out that there's a threat from behind, 
you have to be cognizant of where you are, the groundscape, right? If there's a mountain coming up, you need to know how fast you're going and are you going to go high? If you're at 30,000 feet, right? So quite high, I'm not going to do the metric conversion on my on the fly, but you're extremely high in the air. You have a lot of room to go down, go up, go left, go right, go over. Um, you know, if you go down, you're going to pick up a lot of speed uh, compared to if you're flying very close to the ground, maybe 500 feet over, you don't have much room to go down low, but you can actually use the ground swell to create cover and all sorts of different techniques. So that kind of refers to the Orient. Um, all of those give you options. And when you have options, you then have to decide what you're going to do. Uh, so in this case, maybe you're going to perform a fighter plane maneuver like an Immelman turn, uh, where you kind of go like this and come back around them. Or maybe you're going to do a loop to loop. Or uh, maybe if you're a Top Gun fan, you're going to do an air brake and slow the plane down and let them shoot past you. Uh, you're kind of going through all of this in your head. And finally, you act, uh, which is when you actually do the final action of what we're talking about. Um, Colonel Boyd figured this all out by his own experiences and in interviewing other pilots. And what he found was uh, the successful pilots in combat who'd been through often come to this sort of conclusion. Uh, we're going to have to assume that the unsuccessful pilots were not petitioned for their ideas uh, because they were not around to be asked. But how does this apply to cybersecurity? I'm gonna walk you through how this can actually be adapted and my high level thoughts, and then we're gonna go through some use cases. So for observe, as a network defender, you have a lot of different options. You can actually look at telemetry coming off the systems in your network. Uh, maybe it's Sericata alerts, maybe it's Snort alerts, maybe your FireEye device. You know, maybe you have SIM alerts that are kicking off. Um, or maybe you do like me. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Twitter junkie. I think a lot of people in cybersecurity are. And I'm constantly reading Twitter and looking at tweets and all sorts of things that are going on. And I'm trying to get an idea of what's happening in the news. Or, I don't remember the exact statistic, but at some point, it was something like three quarters of all major breaches were actually detected by a third party like the FBI, and the organization was, uh, was notified. And so that's the observe part, right? Somebody else observed it, but you're getting the information. So in this case, when we talked about observe, it's really observing what's happening. That could be in the news, or that could be an actual threat that's happening in your network. If we looked at Orient, this is where you kind of have to think about your exposure, are we affected? How can we be affected? What does this actually mean? Um, and also the communication. So when we talk about this, it's kind of like, I'll go into more examples as we go through the use cases, but for am I affected exposure, you have to understand like, for example, if there's a threat that's happening to Office 365, one of your first questions should be, are we actually exposed? Do we have an Office 365 instance? Who do I need to talk to about that? Uh, I need to find out, do we have this information? I need to understand what capabilities do we have? I need to communicate with my management and understand our risk appetite. Like how much are we worried about defending against this versus the impact that we might have to our exchange or Office 365 environment? And that's all about understanding what's going on and how. The decide is fairly easy. Uh, you need to do something. This might be an actual physical, you know, a verb, like we might be patching or installing an upgrade. Uh, this might be pulling the systems offline. This might be putting in indicators of compromise and preparing for the future. Um, this is also going to be creating plans and getting stakeholder buy-in and figuring out exactly how you're going to execute whatever it is you've decided to do. And the final point is actually pretty easy, uh, at least in my opinion, it's the act. Now we do it. Uh, I think people are very comfortable with the act. This is a big difference for a lot of network defense teams. I find personally that most of the teams I talk to in the world uh, are very good at observing and then acting. But what they're not great at doing is orienting and deciding. Uh, and this is taking a break. This is stopping. This is, the concept is to go fast. First, you have to go slow. You're doing a preparation. And at first, this is hard for teams to do because there's an active threat. Eventually, with any luck, you're going to get to a position or a posture where you're being proactive with OODA loop to the point where you're not so worried about jumping straight to act because you've been predicting what's happened or you've practiced it so much that you can just kind of go through this very quickly. Uh, but at first, it's a little painful for people to actually stop and think and determine and decide and act. But we'll kind of go into that in the future. Um, for those of you who are Top Gun fans, uh, this is perhaps not so much of a Maverick term, but a nice man. Uh, if you watch the movie, Maverick is actually a horrible pilot. Uh, he's never anyone I'd want to have under my command. He's kind of a rock star. 
Uh, he doesn't do anything by the book, which is not exactly what you want, according to my former time in the U.S. Navy. Um, what you want is probably more like an ice man, someone who's thinking and being methodical and going through all the ideas. Uh, Maverick would probably go straight to act and, um, you know, buzz the tower and kill his crewmen. So don't be a, don't be a maverick when you're doing incident response. So how do we convert the bad news into new opportunities? So uh, some of you may have heard, there's a little virus in the last year called COVID or coronavirus, depending on your time frame of remembering this. Uh, it was pretty horrible. It affected the whole world. Um, obviously it's been horribly impacting to every one of the 7 billion people on this planet rotating the sun. Uh, everyone has dealt with this from a personal level, uh, but we've also dealt with this on a professional level. Um, in the world of cybersecurity, COVID has actually had a major impact. You know, I could talk a lot today about how we've all gone remote work from home, how we're attending conferences virtual instead of all meeting together in San Francisco or in, in Las Vegas. But the reality is this has been a major effect and your organization, if you're watching this and you're in cybersecurity, you have been impacted by coronavirus. So let's take a moment here. We're gonna walk through this as a case study. Let's first look at Observe. Um, a lot of people didn't know how this was gonna impact them at first, but if you look at some of the news sites of the last year, and some of these are very, very recent from you know, the 31st of, um, or sorry, the 1st of March this year, 2021, you can see that the cyber criminals and adversaries and nation state adversaries of the world immediately started using COVID nefariously. And by that, I mean, they did things like create, here we have from the Wall Street Grant or Journal, uh, people were creating fake COVID vaccine websites. So they were creating websites that purported to have uh, vaccines. They were actually pushing out malicious software. Um, things that I remember very strongly from the very beginning of COVID. And the second article here is from um, you know, ZDNet from March 18th, 2020. So almost exactly a year ago. Um, that was thousands of domains were being created that had the word COVID or coronavirus inside of it. Um, and just as a side, if we look over here at InfoSecurity, 70% of orgs had challenges from COVID pandemic. As I said earlier, some of that's remote work from home, some of that's new VPNs, some of it's dealing with Zoom, but a whole bunch of this is just people have issues with clicking through on things that have to do with COVID. So for this case study, we're gonna mostly focus on that idea of malicious domains and IP addresses that are related to COVID. If I look through, and, and this is a good point, you're gonna see some Splunk screenshots here. I work at Splunk, they pay for all my clothing pretty much at this point in my life. Nothing I'm talking about today has anything to do with Splunk other than I'm using it to paint the picture of what we're talking about. So you can do this with whatever tool you want. I'm just using Splunk because I have a free license. So with that in mind, here we have an example where I went through and did a whole bunch of research on COVID earlier last year in March and April, and I did a whole bunch of blog posts. And to do so, I set up a lab and I was looking at malicious things as they came through. I actually pulled that DNS record and you can see, for example, here, I'm looking at DNS off my home lab. Uh, I just put in COVID or Corona. Uh, it's kind of hard to remember at this point, but we used to call this coronavirus a lot more than COVID. Um, and very quickly, I see a whole bunch of domains here that come up with the word Corona or COVID. Uh, I happen to know each one of these is actually malicious and at one time was pushing out malware. I'm using this as an example of observing in your own network. I'm observing that this is occurring. I'm looking, I'm, I'm seeing what's there. This starts to blend a little bit with Orient, uh, but right now it's just, you can imagine this being uh, just like, hey, I heard about this COVID thing. Does this even exist in my network? Should I care? In this case, the answer would be yes. Other aspects of Orient, like we looked at the news sites, but you're gonna wanna reach out to blogs. You're gonna wanna look at things. You're gonna look at peers in the industry. Once again, I, I wrote or helped edit most of these blog posts here, so I'm using them as examples. Uh, but the vendor world especially went crazy talking about how to help and protect yourself against this threat. One other aspect for Orient for COVID-19, I immediately remember thinking like, oh man, what about email? Uh, so a big part of what happens when adversaries actually have something as big news as COVID it's they use that in lures. Uh, and what I mean by lure is for spear phishing. Dave Harold and I, co-worker at Splunk, gave a talk years ago at SAN CTI Summit called uh, the Threat Intelligence Victory Garden. And we talked about how you could actually take APIs from Economist or New York Times and look through them for interesting words and then actually find them in email subjects. Uh, this is an example where I kind of showed some of that here. Uh, if I wanted to look for a domain or a name 
of someone emailing in with basically the word COVID or coronavirus, it might be a good idea. Other aspects here, I'm showing a digital footprint summary of a, a network that I help work at. Um, that's the idea that you need to understand what your ground space is for your own organization. So for I'm talking here, most of the companies in the world are not producing vaccines or they're not healthcare companies. Uh, if you're a healthcare company, if you're developing vaccines, if you're in chemicals, uh, you may actually have a significant amount of websites that actually have the word COVID that are both legitimate for your users to reach out to and look to, but they're also something that your own domain might have and host, right? If you work for a pharmaceutical, Acme Pharmaceutical, you might very well have covid19vaccine.acmepharmaceutical.com or covidlocation.pharmacy.com, something like that. So the orient phase, you also need to understand your own exposure, both from a positive, but also a negative point of view. And this is a good time to gather all that data. In the academic world, I'd probably call this kind of a literature review about the threat. And we're looking at a variety of different sources. As you can tell, I actually tend to spend most of my time in the orient um, and because it uh, allows me to get much better information about where we go next. Finally, if you are talking about domains, which we've been kind of using as the, the stick we're gonna beat this dead horse with here, I always like to use something like domain tools or risk IQ or a whole bunch of other folks who do this. I'm very familiar with domain tools. That's why I'm talking about them here. Um, but this is a perfect example where that word COVID, we know that's bad. I put this into uh, this domain tools tool to actually just look at all the domains that have the word COVID into. And you can see they found 726 records about COVID. Now, the nice thing about this tool is it actually also finds and pivots on infrastructure that is known bad. Uh, so it's not only finding the word COVID, but it's finding things that have to do with COVID that has shared infrastructure and all sorts of things like this. A lot of other tools do this. I just happen to use domain tools because I like it. Um, but this is a good area of Orient as well, of just seeing all the different places that you might be effect affected or targeted by and creating that list of things you need to be aware of. Uh, as we can see here, 123covidclean.com, although I do enjoy that domain, uh, probably has not very much to do uh, with helping people be clean. Decide. When you have to decide what to do, uh, that's where you're gonna start communicating. You're gonna start figuring out what your outcomes are of that research, of that orient, right? Now that you've figured out all the things that could impact you, you need to figure out what to do with it. A lot of this is around external education or determining what's available. What is the risk appetite of your own company, for example? In this case, I'm showing working through our IOC idea. Um, cybercrimesupport.org actually, I believe, hosts a MISP server uh, with a very complicated .e domain here. And that MISP server, if you're unfamiliar with MISP, it's a way to, it's a, it's an open source threat intelligence platform that's heavily used in Europe. Um, and they're actually hosting indicators of compromise as were found by COVID. Uh, for those of you who follow the news, there are also a whole bunch of Slack groups. There's a, a cyber COVID alliance or something like that. Just a lot of different options. And that may very well be how you decide to deal with this initial threat of IOCs, right? You're gonna find people who found bad indicators of compromise around the idea of COVID and coronavirus. You're gonna put that into a threat list and whatever tooling you have. The example I'm giving here is uh, obviously a Splunk one like we talked about, you're gonna do something. But a significant portion of Decide is also communicating. Uh, this is also where you're doing something um, I've always called murder board. I'm sure there's a better term for it, but you're talking to your peers and making sure the solution you're decided on is the strongest. So for example, it's great that you've come up with a way to uh, detect and alert and maybe even block on indicators of compromise. But as David Bianco says, you know, in the pyramid of pain, and I now owe him $100 extra, uh, domains, IP addresses, and hashes, cryptographic hashes of files, are the easiest things to move and manipulate by adversaries. So if you're not also educating your user base, you're failing because you haven't actually gone all the way through, right? People are always going to click on links. You're never going to be able to create and click enough. The final aspect of this is when this is when you're going to be talking to your leadership about what you've decided to do after you've oriented to yourself. Uh, so if you're going to actually put in these blocks uh, for COVID.com, you know, or COVID websites, maybe you're going to be very aggressive on this, or you want to be. You're going to find out that perhaps your leadership, your CISO or your CIO or your CEO, actually wants you to be less aggressive because their risk appetite for their business is lower than what you think the risk appetite should be. So this is where the decide aspect comes in. And then you have to figure out what to do. Once you've decided what to do, 
Uh, I actually think this part's the easiest. You're going to act, right? You're going to do the verb. Now, the reality is the act phase may be the longest thing you do, right? It could be weeks of building on a new solution. It could be days of implementing some sort of different path. Uh, but if you haven't done the orient, observe, or observe, orient, and decide beforehand, you don't necessarily know if you're making the best decision for the act. But like I said, in our world, it's my belief that people tend to go immediately to act uh, because it's very comforting. Uh, it's hard to think. It's hard to do critical analysis. It's hard to work through cognitive thought models, uh, but it's very easy just to pull the trigger and start doing something. Uh, but if you take a step back and you remember the philosophy of to go fast, sometimes you should go slow. Uh, hopefully you'll have a more measured and informed response and have all the answers that you need for your business and to protect yourselves. Let's do uh, another, another use case here, supply chain. So this is very popular. Supply chain, of course, in this case, I'm referring to solar winds. Um, the solar winds attack, hopefully everyone in this, um, this meeting at this point knows this on this conference talk knows about solar winds. But if you're not familiar with it, the very, very high level is that a third party vendor, and I have you know, no, no blame at all to them, I'm not going to anything around uh, the solar winds company in any way. Uh, but the point is this idea of supply chain is that a, a vendor that was trusted by organizations around the world had their software development supply chain compromised. And that compromise led to malicious software being passed through a, a point of trust to thousands, tens of thousands of their customer base and hundreds of them were affected. And this is a very, very difficult pro problem. If anyone has said they've, um, if they've solved supply chain, then they should probably be keynoting RSA in 2022 because I certainly haven't heard it. It's a very hard problem for vendors and customers to deal with. As such, it's a perfect thing for a team to actually look at and war game, right? To actually practice and to apply this concept of OODA loop too. So let's do that. Uh, once again, observe. I've shown up some blogs here that I've written. You know, you, you may be like me, a news junkie, and my Slack started to kick up on Sunday, right? I think it was Sunday, December 10th or something like that, or 16th, something along those lines. Um, so we'll say December 16th, I think, uh, where basically someone said, oh man, FireEye is gonna release a big blog soon. Uh, oh, it might impact, you know, Microsoft might be impacted. I think it's about SolarWinds. And then suddenly, you know, the CISA, CISA which is a part of DHS, released this really big deal, uh, this alert where they actually talked about an APT threat to SolarWinds, right? This is part of that observe. Um, it's really interesting. And I, I think it's key here to understand that 99.99% of organizations around the world had not detected this for months or over a year. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, don't hold me to, I don't have the figure in front of me. I think it was actually the first activity was something like September, 2019. Uh, so this had gone on for years before we detected it or a year and a half plus. Um, and it's difficult for us to say, oh, we should have seen this from our tools. Obviously we didn't. Uh, there was some evidence, for example, there's a, a great IR firm, Volatility, who actually had written a blog post in August of 2020, where they detected some interesting DGA uh, that ended up being related to this larger solar winds campaign, but they just didn't pull the thread enough. Point is, once you hear about it, you have to go do your work. You need to figure out what's happening. And that's where you're gonna learn about supply chains and dependencies. Uh, there was also another piece of news released a couple weeks ago or a month ago about how somebody, a researcher actually uh, basically put a canary into some dependencies in JavaScript and Python, I believe. And then they found out later on that some major, major vendors were actually slurping up those library dependencies in their Python and J JavaScript uh, without reviewing them. And that's actually also a supply chain, a software supply chain. In this case, it's dependencies. So there's a lot of different areas here that you can use to observe and find out. But once you started doing that research, right, you're also gonna look internally. So here's an example of after you found out that news, you need to observe what's happening in your own business. In this case, I've downloaded all the indicators of compromise that were released by Microsoft, FireEye, and CISA. I put them into a lookup list basically in Splunk, and then I looked at my domains. In this case, I'd actually done a wget, and I just wanted to prove that my methodology worked, the blog post I wrote. But imagine if you ran this and you did see that you had a beacon out from one of your internal hosts in devsecurity.com. That's going to change how you orient yourself later. But now, from a scientific method point of view, we're just saying we've observed this happening. Once you start orienting yourself, you're going to figure out a couple different things. One, you know, your, your orientation might be different if you had network traffic going to those IRCs or not. I'm going to assume that we didn't in this case. 
Um, and you're going to reach out and you're going to find more information about specifically what you're interested in. You're going to see what your susceptibility is. Maybe you're going to extrapolate a little bit. Maybe you're doing this months after we're solar winds, like we are now, and you're saying, hey, we already dealt with solar winds, but we're doing this as a war game effort. And you're going to say, who else do we depend on for this sort of um, uh, dependency attack? Or where are we susceptible? If we look here, I've listed out the, you know, the top 25 software companies, Splunk included on this, like everyone is susceptible to this in one way or the other. And you're going to want to figure out how to actually deal with that. Right, and you need to see where you're impacted or not. And this is all about that orient aspect. Another part you're gonna do is you're gonna look for deep dives from people. Uh, Joe is a great researcher at Domain Tools. He does a lot of tweets. I don't think he sleeps at all. He also writes really long form blog prose pieces. Uh, it's a perfect example where you're gonna go through and just get more and more information and build up your own story and narrative. I also believe this is super important for cybersecurity professionals because you need to be confident in what you're talking about for when your leadership asks you questions. In a former life, I used to have what I called the Fox News test where I didn't have to worry about explaining something to my leadership until it made the morning news on Fox News, something similar here. Um, going through folks like this who are deep dive experts, I'm certainly not in this area, uh, was really useful for me to be able to provide answers. And then eventually I did become uh, a deep dive expert on how to help people with solar winds, all part of the Orient aspect. When you start thinking and deciding what to do for something like this supply chain attack, you need to think in a variety of places. Uh, if I was an organization, what I would do, and I'm very lucky that I work at Splunk, so I don't have to stay up in the middle of night thinking about this, but I'd be asking, do I have the telemetry to detect something like uh, the solar wind supply chain attack in the future? Um, I might want to use an open source software like Zeek, uh, which would actually allow me to have DNS records to find things. Uh, DNS, like we talked about, that company volatility, they actually found examples of DGA, domain generated algorithm traffic related to solar winds months ahead of time. They just didn't peel the, you know, peel the onion back far enough. No, nothing against them. No one would ever expect that it was a novel threat. Uh, but could you have detected it? Can you look back at your logs and say, yeah, we have this. And not only that, I have the ability to pull DNS back for two years that it would have been required to determine if we were attacked by this. Right, this is where you're kind of deciding what you're doing. It's a little bit of blend, you know, there's some overlap here with Orient, uh, but it allows you to think through uh, deciding. Tools like Attack, right, another cognitive thought model here. You can look through this and maybe you've, you've made your matrix and you've filled in all the squares that have to do with um, supply chain on the MITRE ATT&CK matrix. Are you able to defend or do you have detections or mitigations or things like that for each one of those matrices? And then on the other side of this, how are you going to deal with those vendors that we talked about earlier? One of the big changes I've seen since SolarWind as a vendor is that customers are asking a lot bigger questions or what, asking much deeper questions about our supply chain. And I'm not the only one. I can tell you any software vendor in the world is dealing with this. And you should be. Customers should be asking their, uh, their vendors these sort of questions. And hopefully they have good answers for you. Uh, but have you come up with that new questionnaire? Have you looked through that, right? Are you going to do that in the future? What's your... What do you do if, um, you know, what if you go to your software vendor and they say, yeah, we don't have any protection. Um, do you have an outcome of that? This is all part of that to size. You may also have to deal with external forces that are compliance. If you are a U.S. government um, customer, for example, your decide uh, may be very tied to your act because the U.S. government basically told every, every civilian agency in the entire world that or U.S. civilian agency in the world to uninstall and remove from the wind solar winds or remove the network this solar wind device. Uh, this is going to be massively different. This can also be thrown in Orient um, and it's going to really change what you decide to do on the other side. Uh, so to me, this is another aspect of that decide. Finally, act once again. Once you've figured out what you're going to do, uh, as I said, this is, uh, I have the least amount to say about this because it's just the noun of doing. Uh, but once you actually have this, you're going to do it. What I haven't talked about yet is a constant iterative process. That's why it's a loop. So once you've actually begun deciding what to do and you act, you're then going to turn around and look all over again. And personally, what I would do is come do a consistent looping of this OODA loop of what did we do? How do we do it? And is this the right choice? And you're kind of looking through and applying this. I've used case studies of actual real, real world events and what's happened, uh, but I haven't gone all the way through them like I normally would in a real incident or activity. So take that as well. Those are places you want to improve. 
So this is now my favorite slide in the whole deck, air breaking your adversary. Uh, what is the whole point of this? And I, I come off as a really big Top Gun movie fan here. I'm not actually a huge Top Gun movie fan. It's perfectly fine. Uh, but thematically, this all worked out very well. Um, air breaking your adversary is what we do in cyber defense. I talked earlier about this concept of fail less or fail a little bit less every day. Um, we have never categorically beaten adversaries against our networks. We work hard to make sure that what we're doing is going to work. But at the end of the day, it does come back. The adversaries come back, they do things. So how do we get past that? Part of what you're doing in life here is just increasing the time to your adversary. They're going to have to go, they're gonna to have to do things. It's taking longer and longer for them to actually build out new infrastructure. If you've looked at the Mandiant, stat, Mandiant stats, the dwell time is actually reduced significantly on networks. So they've had to go back in, come up with new ways. Every time we get better and think harder about coming up with these outcomes, adversaries have to increase the amount of time they do for new and novel attacks. Solar winds was not easy to do on the forefront, uh, although it did make it much more efficient to attack many, many organizations. It was a lot of work to get in there. And now that that's gone, that entire method is down. This is the idea of burning down infrastructure uh, by sharing indicators of compromise, by sharing attack TTPs, all sorts of things like this. Um, adversaries have to come up with new novel ways of attacking. Um, the reason that that adversary created that methodology into solar winds is because the easier routes that they'd used past, in my opinion, probably weren't as successful as they used to be. Uh, so they had to come up with something much harder and much more interesting. This is what we're trying to do as blue teamers. Final part to, to pull from one of my favorite books in the world, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic when you have a plan. I know it's very tempting just immediately pivot into acting, but if you actually take a step back, think about what you're doing, think about why you're doing it, look at your entire profile, look at your exposure, think about your risk appetites. You can make much better decisions when you do execute and you can have a path forward after there. So conclusion, don't think of OODA looping as just a US military or fighter pilot terminology. It has a lot of applicability for your day job Hopefully I've been able to explain this fairly well to you. I use it all the time at work to this day. Um, I think it's a great way to think through problem sets. It's also very easy for you to involve a group and some sort of round table. Uh, in a previous life, in a previous before times, I used to sit down in a conference room where we do this over coffee. Um, now, obviously we're doing it virtual, but you can do this at home. It's very easy, it's absolutely free. Uh, and it just helps you organize and think through things more effectively. I find case studies of previous events critical to helping me build my defenses in the future. Take advantage of other people's successes and failures, read through them, apply them to your world and think through them using something like the Lockheed Martin kill chain or think through it through OODA looping. Uh, thinking is free. It's one of the few things we get to do in cybersecurity that doesn't cost any money. Uh, take advantage of the work that other people have done and written to actually go through. I love thought models. That's probably coming through quite a bit in this talk. Um, you know, I was once again part of the United States Department of Defense. The Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain has been partly ruined by uh, marketing. But if you actually read the white paper that they wrote almost 10 years ago to this month, I believe, I think it was last month was 10 years ago. Uh, it's an incredible piece of work. It really goes through how a brick and mortar defense industrial base global corporation defends against nation state adversaries. Uh, the key here is don't use it for everything. Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain was designed for a defense industrial base organization that has a significant amount of brick and mortar uh, buildings and employees. So it was not necessarily designed for a Silicon Valley 20 person startup with all cloud assets. So use it, but don't, don't, don't be slavish to it. Um, MITRE ATT&CK, same sort of thing, actually developed for people to uh, MITRE, you know, threat intelligence analysts to better group the activities of threat actors. Uh, we in the security operations center world network vendors love it because we can apply it to so many different things, but understand the context of how that thought model was created and how it can apply to you. Uh, Katie Nichols and I, formerly of MITRE, she's now at Red Canary, gave a talk at Black Hat two years ago, where we talked about all the ways that people go wrong with MITRE attack. Uh, so if you're interested, take a look at that talk. It might help you out. Finally, OODA loop, I absolutely love it, but it has very specific applications. So use a combination of these, go through them. Once again, it's all free. Uh, it's just helping you think better. 
I'm a huge fan of 30, 60, 90 days. Um, in this case, I was obligated to do um, next week, three months, and six months, but the idea is the same. Think about how you can actually use OODA loop in your incident responses um, immediately. Hopefully, you've started thinking about that today. After this, start applying it to more than just your immediate break fix IR. How do you look at the news, right? Maybe you're using this to create hunting uh, hypotheses. Maybe the outcome of your hunting hypotheses, which is your you know, observe, is then you go into the orient, decide, and act based on the outcomes of your hunting hypotheses. After six months, what I really hope you're able to do is go back and review the success or failure of these OODA loop uh, incidents, right? Actually document the outcomes of these and go through and try to iteratively improve which goes back to the final theme, hopefully you no longer think is negative, which is fail less. Every day you fail, but tomorrow, try to fail a little bit less. That's what I do in life. And that's what I hopefully did for this talk. So with that information, my name is Ryan Kovar. I work at Splunk and you can find me on Twitter on MeanSec. Thank you very much.